So, I mean, I teach um, two classes that focus on how we eat uh, here and how, how the world eats and how we eat. One's a thematic English 101 that's about how we eat in the United States. And last year I started a thematic 102, English 102, that focuses on, on globalization. Uh, and, you know, I think the entry level for that as far as talking to students is, is for a lot of people, our students especially, uh, people that haven't traveled, the, the first entry to uh, foreign cultures is through Taco Bell or uh, you know some international cuisine that they go to a local restaurant. And then, of course, those uh, restaurants are hardly authentic international. Uh, I think the best example of this is uh, food courts in today's malls are... Uh, in a postmodern sense, this sort of simulacra of the other, you know, and yet um, they're not at all authentic. That's not to say there isn't increasing authenticity in uh, foods available for us to access locally, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. So uh, I really started, you know, I, I've traveled a lot, and when I started thinking about this stuff, I I think back to the first trip I ever did abroad, which was uh, in 1987, and I went to Brazil, me and a buddy, and I uh, found myself up in Manaus in the jungle, and just overwhelmed by, by Manaus and the humidity and the heat and the jungle madness. And, um, but there was a Chinese restaurant there, and it was a Chinese restaurant, like total American style, China, uh, Brazilian style, but you know, very familiar China style Chinese restaurant. We ended up, we were in Manaus for like, five days, we end up eating there every day. Uh, you know, here we are, you know, we weren't that adventurous uh, culinarily uh, yet. Uh, and so it's like, okay, there's Chinese restaurant in the middle of Amazon jungle. And then a year later, I, I was in Mali, West Africa, in Bamako, and there was nothing familiar there whatsoever, uh, except that having a US passport, we had free access to the uh, US embassy where uh, the commissary served hamburgers and french fries and so we ended up going to the US commissary all the time to get when we were in Bamako to get hamburgers uh, just because there was nothing familiar there at all and you know I was still young and not that adventurous with what I ate and sort of overwhelmed um, but you know there you go US commissary and the embassy and get some hamburgers and then last year I found I was in Columbia, and you know, I started by this time. I was had already started sort of reconciling my restaurant life with my teaching life and my interest in food academically and stuff. And I, I noticed the number of U.S. fast food chains in Columbia, particularly are Dom, Domino's. And I remember one particular Domino's pizza shop in Cali. Uh, and I remember it because one, it was brand new. It was just bright and shiny. It was always crowded. It was like three blocks from my hotel. It was always crowded. I was in Cali for like five nights. And a block away from it, there was a, an outdoor street vendor food court where there was complete, legitimate, authentic Colombian food. You know, chorizo on a stick, grilled chorizo on a stick, uh, chicharron, which they would batter in uh, sweet plantain dough and then deep fry. Yet a block away, and these places were always crowded. They opened in the evening, and there was always a crowd there, yet within a block, there was always a crowd at this Domino's Pizza. And I was like, so, you know, really, you know, what's going on here? That's kind of where I started really thinking about how to, to look more into it. Um, you know, the question is, has globalization impacted the way people eat around the world? Yes, it has. But is it negative or positive? You know, what's the degrees of this? Um, so in my thematic English 102 class, I, I assigned an essay by James Watson called China's Big Mac Attack. And he concludes his essay by asking the question, you know, whose food culture is it anyway? And I think, you know, that's an interesting question when we talk about globalization and food. Uh, you know, what does it mean for local ways of eating when food corporations go global? Does it destroy culture? Um, on one hand, there's sort of the cultural imperialism theory. 
Uh, and from an essay called Food and Culture Interconnections by Margaret Visser, uh, she says, you know, globalization when it comes to food can be, quote, a battering ram destroying cultural patterns. That's pretty strong stuff. Um, or, as Watson argues in, in his China's Big Mac attack, it's really not, you can't really blame it on international food corporations, US, basically Western food corporations, because what's happening is there's just shifts happening, you know, cultural shifts happening within societies that create space for US companies and other Western food corporations to, to, to fill. And so there, it's, not, it's not fair to summarize, to paraphrase Watson, to, to blame it on McDonald's. Uh, and sort of to, to mirror that, Visser in the same essay writes that food change can be an enrichment. It could mean increased security in access to food, especially in developing countries, uh, pleasurable discovery, and a broadening of horizons. So which one is it? Or is it something in between? Uh, Domino's Pizza in, in Colombia, Big Macs in Hong Kong. I, I was in Hong Kong for the handover back in 97. My older brother had been living there for over a year working for Walmart. Um, he always wanted to go to McDonald's. And by now, I was an adventurous eater. I was like, I'm not going to McDonald's. I mean, we had to go get some real food. I mean, Hong Kong's a great food city. Coca-Cola, uh, corn, soybeans on more of the industrial scale. It is all sorts of food products are traded and consumed around the world. Uh, but per the exhibit that's going to come here, the original globally traded food commodities were spices. Uh, you know, spices were exotic, expensive, and yet very popular for people that could access them. Um, I did some research on some medieval cookbooks through Yale. And uh, there was a cookbook, a medieval cookbook titled El Libre del Coach uh, of Master Robert. That's the title, written for the King of Naples. And there's some 200 recipes in this cookbook. 154 of them call for sugar, 225 require cinnamon, 76 ginger, 54 saffron. Uh, there is a wedding in 1475 uh, for the Duke of Bavaria and uh, Miss Jadwiga of Poland, and this must have been a big wedding because the spices, 1475, that they ordered for this wedding included 386 pounds of pepper, 286 pounds of ginger, 257 pounds of saffron, 205 pounds of cinnamon and cloves, and 86 pounds of nutmeg. So these spices not only flavored the food, obviously, but if you sort of, you know, if you cook, those spices are all warm spices, as most spices are. Uh, and so th these, they have warm and dry humoral properties, uh, which were meant to counter the moist, wet properties of meat and fish. So middle-aged spices were equally used for culinary reasons and medicinal reasons. Um, now, so I, I, that's some research I did through Yale Global Online. So, you know, the medicinal qualities of food is well noted throughout history, but I'm not sure that Domino's Pizza in Cali, Colombia, or Kentucky Fried Chicken in Peru uh, falls under that. Uh, I have an article I use in my, my Thematic 102 class, it's a 2012 article from Bloomberg, Bloomberg Business News that makes the case that Peru has the highest uh, number Second only to China, the highest number of U.S. fast food corporations, restaurants in the world. And, you know, second only to China. Uh, that in and of itself might not be that surprising unless you are aware of the state of Peruvian cuisine in today's foodie world. For the last several years, Peruvian cuisine has probably been the golden child of international cuisines. Lima is arguably... Uh, you know, I'd say two, three years ago, Lima was the hippest food city in the world. It's certainly one of the trendiest food cities in the world to this day, uh, and certainly in Latin America. Uh, and proving cuisine, there's this resurgence in proving cuisine, and proving cuisine is Andean, it's Amazonian, it has African influences, it has obviously European influences. A lot of it 
in ingredient and technique is pre-Columbian. So, you know, what's going on there? On one hand, you have this resurgence, this renaissance in, in a national indigenous cuisine. On the other hand, you have more U.S. fast food restaurants in the country than anywhere but China. And obviously, Peru is not as big as China. Um, the Peruvian chef Gaston Acurio has restaurants in 11 countries. I mean, this is a cuisine that's exported. There is, I haven't been to it yet, I keep trying to go there. Have you been to it? The Peru, there's a Peruvian restaurant in Gig Harbor, which I've read has excellent reviews. It's, it's authentic Peruvian cuisine in Gig Harbor. I grew up in Gig Harbor. They, we had, they had to fight, when I was growing up in Gig Harbor, people didn't want to let the McDonald's come in there. I mean, there was a, a organized community resistance to McDonald's. But now there's a Peruvian restaurant in, um, in Gig Harbor. So my question to my students in, my, in the class is, you know, how to, can we reconcile this? Is it, does it make sense that, that a, a nation has such a, a popular uh, national cuisine that's being exported and consumed in Peru, yet you have these, these numbers of a uh, number of fast food, U.S. fast food restaurants in Peru. Um, the reality is that this is a complex issue and there's no simple answer. Uh, another very difficult, probably the most difficult article I have my students read in this class is uh, called Industrial Tortillas and Folkloric Pepsi, The Nutritional Consequences of Hybrid Cuisine in Mexico by Jeffrey Pilcher. And uh, I, I, first of all, I've spent a lot of time in Mexico and I love Latin America. And it's one of the reasons I sort of picked this article. But even more specifically, Pilcher writes about uh, this town called San Juan de Chamula in Chiapas, which is outside of San Cristobal de las Casas. I've been there. Uh, this is a completely indigenous Mayan town, you know, less than 100 miles from the Guatemalan border. It's not the type of place you'd want to go to these days with the narco stuff going on down there. Um, this is an indigenous Mayan town. Spanish is a second language. And one of the things I remember when I was there, they have a Catholic church there, like all Catholic churches throughout the highlands of, of Mexico and Guatemala. It's, uh, there's no pews. And in this particular church, the St. John the Baptist, that's the name San Juan, uh, is in the front, has replaced Christ on the cross. And when I was there, there was a Mayan woman who was taking a live chicken and doing this over her ill husband's head. Uh, the chicken, the healing had to go through a living, you know, we're not talking animal sacrifices here, we're talking a living chicken. And I asked her, you know, are you Catholic? And she says, yeah, somos catalicos. Uh, I was raised in a very progressive Catholic family, but Catholic, you know, very Catholic nonetheless. And this blew me away. I mean, I was like, wow. You know, this is, this, is, this is actually cool. You know, this is so much more interesting than going to Mass out in Gig Harbor. Um, and so what, what, what Pilcher writes about in his essay is that in, in San Juan Chamula, I didn't see this. I wasn't looking for it. This was back in 91, I think, when I was down there. I've been down there a couple times. This particular village has, used, has integrated Pepsi-Cola into all their religious rituals. Um, they use it instead of wine at the church. They give it cases of it in dowries. They have empty bottles and, and, and marketing posters, ragged marketing posters, according to this article, set up on the family shrines next to the crucifix. Um, what's going on there again? Uh, so I have a, 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 you know, a question I ask my students when they read this article is, is who's winning here? If, you know, winning is, a, you know, is this a victory for culture? Because after all, these people are still practicing a 500-year-old syncretic form of Catholicism. And you, know, you can make the argument that 500 years ago, the Catholics, you know, the Spanish came in and, you know, took over the, the local culture. But if you've studied Catholicism in Latin America, it's very polytheist. And it was 
the polytheist religions were able to adapt to the, the saints. Thus, they have Saint John in front of the, the church rather than Jesus. Uh, so that culture still exists. You know, another thing, if you study religion in Latin America, there's a huge trend towards Western U.S. evangelicals. It's kind of a repeat of the, the conquest of 500 years ago, going in and, and you know, there, you would never use a chicken for things like that. So on one hand, yes, they're using Pepsi-Cola, but they're still practicing, you know, forms of the syncretic Catholicism, which has been around for, for over 500 years. Or is this a victory for transnational modernization, i.e. Pepsi-Cola? I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I, there's not a right answer there. there you know, Pepsi-Cola has replaced wine, yet they're still you know, participating in these, these ancient you know, or old um, rituals. So, you know, the cultural imperialism argument is what foodies often go to, you know, that, look at globalization is killing the way people eat. It's destroying local ways of eating, local patterns of eating. Um, and obviously the term cultural imperialism has negative connotations, right? But does it necessarily have to be a bad thing in the context of food and globalization? Um, Watson, uh, James Watson, who I referenced, has another article, actually I, I think it's an adapt, adaptation from the first one that he put in another book, but this one's specifically called McDonald's in Hong Kong. And uh, on one hand, he writes of children, young children, who now refuse to eat at dim sum tea houses with their parents or grandparents because they want to go to McDonald's. Score one for the culture imperialism theorists, right? that, hey, McDonald's is destroying local patterns of eating. On the other hand, he writes that, and this is a quote, most Chinese customers see the company McDonald's as a force for the improvement of urban life. Clean toilets were a welcome development in cities where until recently a visit to the public restroom could be harrowing. So, you know, you have something like sanitation as an exported Western value. And if you've ever traveled abroad, one, you know, you sort of really got not to be in path. One thing I always love to do is go to markets. And markets, by our standards, are, aren't sanitary. Uh, that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're you know, full of disease, but they're certainly not prepackaged and scrubbed and sanitized. Um, so you have values like sanitation and cleanliness that are exported when, when we talk about food. Uh, does it matter? Isn't that a good thing? Some of my students say, that's a good thing. Others say, well, it changes things. So I wanted to find an article that, that sort of argued that it's not necessarily a good thing. And so I found a, um, in Gastronomica, uh, are you guys familiar with Gastronomica? It's a great publication. Uh, out of Berkeley. Anyway, uh, it talks about the, the traditional Turkish bread called simit. Uh, and this is a 2012 article. And expl it, it explained that the Turkish government, in an attempt to uh, woo the European Union, made all street vendors with their little street carts, everything had to be sold under glass for sanitation purposes. Fair enough. However, when it comes to this traditional bread, by putting hot bread under glass, it created steam and moisture and changed the texture of the bread to where people rejected it. And, you know, according to the article, it's a good thing that the, the laws are not heavily enforced, but it, it changed the bread. People rejected the traditional way of buying this off the street because suddenly it was sold in little glass cases and it wasn't crispy anymore. That's not a good thing. Um, I don't think, I mean, that changes the authenticity, authenticity of the, the original. Uh, now, so another thing we look at in my class when we talk about sort of exporting Western values related to food, I mean, this is, it's important to recognize this isn't all about food. Uh, and this is, you know, my 102 class is designed to be a companion course to my 101 class. And one of the things I say in the first day of my 101 class is that this class is pretty much about the way we eat, what we eat in the United States, uh, you know, what we put into our bodies, but we can't separate that out from issues of 
of social justice, labor issues, uh, and environmental issues. It all goes together. Uh, so one, you know, one thing that we export in U.S. fast food restaurants around the world is, is amenities that we find appealing. And uh, 2014 article from Bloomberg News talks about the popularity of KFC in Nigeria. Uh, since 2009, KFC has opened 25 restaurants in Nigeria. Um, the attraction to customers is that the lights are on, is that they have power, is that they're air conditioned and they have Wi-Fi. Yet people go there, even though to get a three-piece chicken meal at a KFC as of 2014 in Nigeria cost around 11 US dollars and the average Nigerian makes about $1.25 a day. So, you know, it's not about food. It's about places that sell the food, providing these Western uh, uh, you know, amenities, not unlike the clean toilets that, that, that McDonald's offers throughout China. Um, so as a foodie, I'm, I'm moving through this quicker than I intended to, but that's okay. My concern is about the cuisine, uh, although we can't separate food from culture. Uh, in Visser's article that I already mentioned, she writes, uh, you know, eating another country's, uh, no, another culture's diet does not give you the rest of that culture. And of course, if we've traveled, we all know that, you know, I can go eat, um, you know, street tacos, tacos de, de sesos or something off the streets of Mexico City, and that doesn't make me Mexican or, you know, even truly understand Mexican culture in any which way. Uh, there's always these other cultural, social issues. But the, the, the central question remains, is globalization changing local ways of eating? Um, it doesn't appear so in, in a country like Peru, which all these KFCs exist there, but there's a thriving national food scene in Peru that's it's so popular that it's exported. And like I said, it's exported. There's a Peruvian restaurant in Gig Harbor. Um, there's an irony with this though, as, as globalization brings more authentic, creates greater access of, to authentic cuisines here in the United States and throughout Europe, that this creates a new awareness and appreciation of these cuisines and all you gotta do is turn on the TV uh, and all the travel culture you know, shows and magazines and books. And so with this new awareness, there's an increase in what is called food tourism. Uh, people traveling and food tourism in countries like Italy and stuff have been around for a long time, but you know, now people are going to exotic, you know, developing countries to try their, their cuisine. And uh, what happens when all these people with income go to countries like, you know, Andrew Zimmer goes to Guatemala and eats traditional Mayan food and suddenly a lot of people go down to Antigua, Guatemala where I have very close friends that live uh, and I've been talking to them since, you know, I don't know if anybody watches Bizarre Foods but he aired a show in Guatemala just midsummer. And my friends have already seen an increase of people showing up in Antigua to, to go to the restaurants that he featured. And, you know, this, this is authentic food. I mean, this is indigenous cuisine. Well, what happens is that that drives up demand, right? And then that drives up cost. And that makes it more difficult, more expensive for local people to eat their own food. And... In, in Pilcher's essay on industrial tortillas and folkloric Pepsi, he, he, you know, he puts this irony perfectly well. He says, one of, the, one of the modern world's great ironies is that only the wealthy can afford to eat like peasants. And I mean, this is increasingly the case. And that, to me, is ultimately the, the danger of globalization and food. And that's my... My little talk. Is there any questions or comments or anything? How long have they been using Pepsi in the state of Hawaii? I mean, it's what? been a while that Pepsi's been in our culture. It goes back to uh, 
It's interesting. It goes, I think it's the 30s, and the reason it, 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 it coincides with the, the road system throughout Mexico that they finally got roads to some of these remote villages. And at the time, the alcalde or mayor of that particular village, which, you know, that the, the political system down there is very much tied in with the cofradia, the, the traditional Mayan uh, religious orders. Uh, that's what I wrote my master's thesis on. Um, although it was a travel writing piece, but it got kind of anthropological. Um, the original Calde was got the first, as soon as they opened it up to Rhodes, he got the first Pepsi distributorship. So there's politics to it, you know? And, but, so it's, it was like early, late 30s. Uh, so, it, you know, it's obviously not 500 years old, but now it's just been integrated into to that culture, according to, to this article, which is you know a peer-reviewed academic article. I don't have any reason to doubt the validity yeah, of that. I but it, that, I just think it's interesting that it's like so prized, you know, like you said, wedding gifts. And well, I'm, yeah, <laughs> and, and I, and yeah, cool. yeah, uh, you know, using it, having, you know, I. I, I when I first read that, I thought perhaps it had to do with the influx of evangelicals because traditionally they would use either wine or aguardiente in a lot of rituals down there. Um, and if you've ever drank, you know, indigenous Mayan or Peruvian, any indigenous aguardiente stuff, you know, it's nasty. <laughs> I mean, uh, but no, it had to do with, with business and politics that this guy got a Pepsi distributorship. So he successively integrated into the local culture and now it's part of it. Uh, but you know, that, according to Pilcher, it's, that's really the only change. I mean, there's still, and, and like, you know, I was there and I, I didn't see Pepsi, I wasn't looking for it, but as of 1991, they were still using live chickens in their healing ceremonies inside the Catholic church. Fully, fully saying, yeah, we're Catholics. They, they saw no, no problem there. Um, other questions or comments about any of this? We well, kind of hate to see that. I mean, I kind of hate to see that invasion, and hopefully it doesn't take over the, the cultural foods, because you, kind of, you go somewhere to get a different perspective and a different taste of something. Um, uh, and this is this is tangential to that point, but I was even trying to think. Okay, I need to go get some chicken feet to make a good chicken broth. But where do you go now? You don't go to an American supermarket. You have to go to the Chinese supermarket to, to go get stuff like that. Sure, but at least there's a Chinese supermarket here, yes, though. I mean, that's that, that, right. I mean, why is that? Why why have we? Why can't we get this stuff that we used to use anymore? And so now you're saying in these other countries we're kind yeah. of going filters over there. <laughs> I mean, you know, and there's the whole. There's the whole glocal trend is the, the food studies word where, you know, restaurants, you know, if you go to, to even Hong Kong and go into a McDonald's or something, they have, they have what we get here, but they also have local fare, you know. Um, but, you know, I think that the story about the, the, the children not wanting to go eat dim sum is 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 telling it because I you know I there's a generational thing happening here that that how long how many generations will it take uh, and you know to where um, that you know well, that has to be it's, well yeah I mean and that's globalization I mean it's there's nothing we can do about it yeah. I mean I my my students in the 102 class their their final research I and mean, we used a book um, Hungry Planet what the world eats is 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 you know, I provide most of the readings, but that's a required text because they have to pick a developing country out of that book. If you're familiar with the book, it's a coffee table book that has 20 some different countries represented with one or two families from each country. And it's, it's the same outfit that did the American junk, you know, all our possessions book. So they basically have, they, they, they watch what a family eats over the course of a week and then it's, it's, a, it's a coffee table, beautiful book. So then they have a picture of all their food stuff and it sort of breaks down what they eat. And so, you know, students in 102 are gonna do an argument of inquiry where they have to research that particular country, you know, starting with those, the families in the book and see. The question isn't whether globalization has impacted the way people eat around the world, it has. 
the question is whether that change is good or bad, and what to what degree. And and there is there isn't a fixed answer there. I mean, you know, I think there's again, if you're talking about you know security, that there's there's food, access to food, access to calories within what kind of calories. Um, you know, I have a article that I don't use, or no, I don't use it, but it talks about somewhere in New Guinea where the writer, the author of the article was somewhere in New Guinea and there was uh, some relief mission had brought in uh, ramen, you know, instant ramen, and the, they, weren't, they weren't cooking it. What they were doing is chewing on the noodles and dumping the packet straight in their mouth, which is just pure sodium, right? You know? And that's the way they were eating it. Uh, and that was a sort of a traded commodity within that village, you know, to get the ramen packs. And, you know, they weren't, they weren't, they, and the, the, the issue with that became is they didn't have uh, ready access to potable water. Even, I mean, any, even water that they'd want to bring to a boil and cook this in. And so it just had become over a generation since it started showing up there by missionaries, people just chewing on the pack and dumping the, you know, uh, but you know, it's 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 just it's globalization. It's it's my interest now with food. But when I was researching my master's thesis in um, the highlands of Guatemala, there was some some kids who were watching a, a Space Jam, the Michael Jordan movie, and they had a little TV and they had a, a VCR hooked up to a car battery, and they were watching this. And they asked me if if. If you know if Michael Jordan was real, and if I could get to my house in a spaceship, because that movie is part animation and part Michael Jordan, they couldn't differentiate between the two, and you know there's just total disconnect. And so eating ramen. Uh, the, the thing is, is that I would argue that you know food is is I, I would argue outside of language is the most significant cultural signifier that there is. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is having an impact, and we'll see how. I think it's also interesting if we look at you know, the diversification of our societies. I mean, what is America? Mm -hmm. if you try to come up with American cuisine, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Anyone in this room would suggest, oh, that's my cuisine, because I too am American. Um, so with, <clears throat> I think uh, there are many places around the globe um, where the global mixing and mingling of people um, is stronger or more or less pronounced. And so if we look here in these, at what we eat, um, I think many people today also for changes in our behavior, I mean, who buys those pizzas? I mean, American food's pizza. Pizza, this one is that American food. Yeah, so well. Italian. And so, so I'm just wishing to put this forth. I mean, what is American food and what are our eating habits and how many of us go to the freezer section? Yeah, and, well, yeah. And, you know, a... we buy the Chinese and the Mexican and this and the other. And the question is, um, how have our own cooking habits changed? Because it's, it's almost now uh, less expensive to make pizza when you buy it frozen than if you were to make it. Oh, frozen. absolutely. And so the question is, how are we pricing ourselves out of that? No, absolutely. Food? And I, I, I bring that up the cost in my 101 thematic class, which is about the national diet here in the United States, is that, hey, when, when I was growing up out in Gig Harbor, my dad taught here, the, you know, first of all, the only McDonald's around was right here on 6th Ave. And it was far more expensive for my parents to come into McDonald's than it was to get a pot roast with some potatoes and some carrots and, and throw it in the oven. Um, that's not true. I mean, it was a treat. It, you know, it was payday. It paid it. 10th and the 25th, you know, we always went to somewhere, you know, because we're a big family and we like to eat. And, but now you can eat off a dollar menu or a value menu at any fast food restaurant. And it's far cheaper than even getting the, the most inexpensive cut of meat and some potatoes and throw it. It's not cheap, that is correct. At the same time, all the warnings suggest you should get away, go away, you know, try to avoid as much processed food as, as possible. And all the food we're eating now is processed. Yeah. And so it's no longer the, the homegrown chicken that we eat is the chicken one. We're not quite sure if it's still chicken. That we eat. <laughs> I, I, and so, nu uh, nuclear chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. The, the, I, I think that the, the thing that we got to remember is even though we can talk about cuisines, you know, and Mexico and you know 
Chinese cuisine is considered a mother cuisine. But there's not one cuisine in China. You know, there's not one cuisine in Mexico. I've traveled all throughout Mexico, and the food in Mexico City is different from the food in Guadalajara, Guadalajara let alone Oaxaca or the Yucatan. Uh, and so, you know, but going back to the spice trade, food has always been globally influenced. I mean, you know, people, you know, wrongly associate potatoes with Ireland. Well, potatoes are from the Andes, you know, and tomatoes sauce with Italy. Well, tomatoes are from the Mesoamerican Central Valley, you know. Uh, you know, we don't, the only indigenous protein to, to the United to the Americas is turkeys and duck. I mean, you know, we don't, pigs came by the Spanish. I mean, you can go see the original pigs in San Augustine, Florida, arguably. There's, there's relatives of the original pigs to land in the Americas, uh, and they're a very coveted uh, heritage breed now. Uh, cattle came from somewhere else. Chickens, as we know them, came from somewhere else. But it's so appropriate because I recall that when I was growing up in Germany, uh, one part of my family, they considered that if a meal did not have potatoes and meat, it wasn't a meal. <laughs> and so I was thought, potatoes are German until I met my sure. husband from Chile. He said, no, that's ours. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are the originators of, of potatoes. And yeah. there's no way, you know, there is no German meal and he ate, it doesn't have potatoes. And so in my mind, German, potatoes mean German too. And so I think um, the same as I teach German here. Yeah. And so the meals that the textbook now mentions are as much uh, associated with uh, Turkish origins and Greek origins and these and that and the other ones <coughs> because what is German? <laughs> yeah. And nowadays. And, and no, it's. A, 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 and I think that that's a, that you can make an argument that that's one of the, you know a positive influence of globalization, you know. But then, when like you said, if, if you know, I, I think there's also the argument about the role of you know industrialization and 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 mechanization and food science that you know creating all this frozen food and just cultural shifts and you know our need for convenience. Uh, and people don't cook anymore, you know. I, I you know, I think that I, I tell my students, and you know, I, I always got to be careful because I'm teaching composition classes here. I'm not teaching food study classes. I have to reel myself in sometimes. That, but um, you know, I think you can be farm to table, completely, you know, hundred mile radius around Tacoma, and eat or everything organic. That's like the high end. These days, if I don't care if you go to, you know, that they're. It, I don't know if it's still open, but there used to be the dollar food store across the street, 6th Ave, grocery outlet or whatever. <laughs> you could go to a grocery outlet and buy some whole foods, not organic, not who knows where they came from, but a roast that's got to be sold because it's getting old, <laughs> and sit and cook your own food. And that's still in the right direction compared to going to the frozen food section or to a, you know, a fast food restaurant. Uh, you know, you're still cooking your own food, even though that's far removed from you know, sourcing local organic ingredients and, and getting all fancy. Uh, but people don't, even, you know, people, don't, people don't do that, people don't cook. But the preparation of food, you know, the more it becomes remote from the family, that we also don't chat as we prepare that food. And so we do an F1. There's not so much conversation around food preparation. Now we no. just will take a pizza, we'll eat it in 15 minutes, but it's ready. But in the meantime, what should we be doing in that kitchen? And yeah. So it, it used to be that these were um, meaningful moments of con you know, Absolutely. connections, of learning through generations, and also of, um, of literally knowing what you're feeding yourself with, the closer touch. I mean, yeah. if you look at that potato or chicken, and, Today we can find many children and grown people who have never seen that live chicken and wouldn't know how to draw it. They just know the chicken strips. <laughs> well, that's a lot of change, change too. I mean, it's economic change. People go to fast food, not only fast, it's cheap. So there's economics, and then uh, the family dynamic has changed. Absolutely. You know, people are working all the time. It's harder to come home and make a dinner from scratch and all of that kind of thing, which is unfortunate because it is a big. It's a big, you know, kind of joining thing, and I, I, I'm grateful that my family was like that, and that's how we have it in our family. But it's hard. You come home, two people come home from work, and you're all tired, and you're like, okay, let's go to prep the food, and you know, so it, it is more challenging right now.
Yeah, no, it's, 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 I mean, there's, th that's why I think food is such a great interdisciplinary topic. I mean, it's the sustainability. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, absolutely. Can we still sustain ourselves and, and with the industrial revolution and our technological and robot yeah. revolution? You're really moving away from what we used to know as life. Yeah, and we can't, you know, it's like the way Michael Pollan concludes on the words of lemons that we can't return to a hunter gatherer state. That's not, you know, it's not, it's not going to happen. There's too many people and there's not enough land. I mean, it's an ideal, but, uh, you know, there's got to be some in between between the total industrial and the, you know, and the, you know, and, and organic is, and stuff, that stuff's so expensive. But I, and it takes effort. It's, especially seasonally, especially like now to, I tell my students, especially spring quarter and fall quarter, that you can, farmer's markets aren't expensive if stuff's in season. You know, I, I find that, you know, you're, you're not, you know, but uh, you gotta, you know, you, know, you gotta get to them. And increasingly they're everywhere, but that's, you know, that's really just the middle of summer when that's true. Uh, or you gotta know how to cook with with no, winter rest vegetables and stuff. No, no, not at all. And yeah. And it's funny because you see I mean just among my friends growing up and and we cook, you know. Uh so we have gatherings where everyone ends up in the kitchen and, and we're actually cooking. Usually it's me cooking and and but you still get people hanging around the kitchen, but they're not cooking. They're, they're hanging around the, pizza, the kitchen eating pizza out of the, the, the delivery box. You know, there's still that draw to the kitchen. But you see, you know, it's like, well, we got some Chinese delivery or some Indian takeout or whatever. And everyone's still standing around the kitchen eating because it's the, that, that, that's the eating part of it that's still social. But, you know, it's cooking. I, I mean, I... I I, we have parties once a month with 20 people, and, and you know I put people to work, you know, and they enjoy it, and enjoy it until you know as long as people practice relatively safe kitchen practices. I don't want you know fingers getting cut off and stuff because someone had a beer. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting topic, and it's. Uh, but your studies have, have really enabled you to, to make those observations too. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had to... But you also see change happening as you... It's not just you discover, oh, it's different here, but no. you also detect that change over time. Yeah, and I've... Uh, in fact, I want to... I was... The, the UW Center for Asian Studies is... If anyone's... I, I'm, I'm supposed to send out the email. I haven't got it yet because it's through the Northwest International Education Association. It's got some pretty generous grants for a uh, two-year college faculty to integrate Asian studies into their classrooms, uh, like $2,000 just for a, a module. It's $4,000 to revise them. No, I haven't got it yet. I, we just had the board meeting last Friday, and they're supposed to send it to me. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, because this, this Watson article that, that I, I, you know, Big Mac in China and stuff is $2,000. Uh, and, you know, that's only three years after Hong Kong was returned to Chinese rule, and so I'm thinking about applying to, to pursue, to look at you know, a more current situation and, and sort of tie it into, has there been because of, I mean, you know, Hong Kong is still pretty autonomous, but you know, look at if there's under, you know, whatever, 16 years now, Chinese rule, has it changed things? Uh, yeah, it's it, and they even got travel money. I mean, it's 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 there there, and it's it's two years two year college curriculum development. Sure, I think yeah. Working on many fronts, and and, and I think you connect it to connect yeah. the yeah. global yeah. studies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To local studies, to experiential learning, to, to community yeah. networking, and so. And it's the second year they're doing it. Last year they had four people applied, and all four people got funded. <laughs> so it's like, wow, cool. Um, anyway, yeah, well, that's my little talk. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming.